I'll offer somewhat of a contrarian take, and I said this yesterday on a panel. Um, it was a real cool moment for me. It was on a panel with like Adam Back and Turtle Meester and um, a few others, and uh, in front of the, the audience on the main stage, and they asked the same question of like, "Hey, how do, how do we think of the having?" Um, and Adam was ultra bullish. I uh, was saying, you know, 100K before the having, which was uh, certainly an interesting perspective. Um, but I, I'm in the opinion that the, at the current time, uh, maybe not in previous cycles, um, the having is somewhat of a diminishing effect, right? As you know, the supply reduction, you know, the the relative amount of issuance that gets cut is 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 in half every single time. Um, and so I think paradoxically. Everybody's like, it's a slot, it's a supply event. And at the margin, it is. Mm-hmm. You know, the supply, you know, at the margin, going from 900 Bitcoin a day to 450 matters in issuance. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think it's more of a demand driver, par- paradoxically. And here's why is that um, the having the flow, I think, is, is much less significant than the stock at this point. Mm-hmm. What's really driving this is net accumulation by hodlers and at the same time, you know, the distribution, right? And this, this is what's kind of driving the boom and bust, right? Using just the having as, you know, this data point every four years as like the single driver of the Bitcoin market, I think doesn't do justice to just how much data we have at our disposal. Like there's so much data, whether it's UTXO set data or like global macro data as Bitcoin increasingly becomes entrenched um, in this global financial system that points to like Bitcoin being much more than just like a, oh, having you know press the green button up on right, right, right. the bitcoin halving is scheduled for april 2024 which is just six months away and it's going to send bitcoin screaming higher but not for the reason you think that's the message out from dylan leclerc in his latest interview if you haven't heard of him before dylan leclerc is a well-known bitcoin and on-chain expert he's amassed a huge following for two reasons firstly his extremely accurate predictions on bitcoin and macro trends And secondly, his extremely detailed and intricate on-chain analysis. Leclerc is truly a Bitcoin expert, and in his latest interview, he breaks down the upcoming Bitcoin halving. He has a contrarian viewpoint. He doesn't think the cut in Bitcoin supply coming onto the market will have as big an effect as it has in the past. Rather, the halving and the narrative surrounding it is going to be much more mainstream and well-known this time around, and that will be what forces the Bitcoin price upwards. The Bitcoin supply is so tightly held by long-term holders that all it needs is a spark of demand to send its price soaring. Make sure to stick around to the end of the video where Leclerc dives deep into factors such as inflation, debt, and money printing, which will contribute massively to Bitcoin's price. Also guys, if you want to stay most up to date on the crypto world, I send out a daily 5 minute crypto newsletter that covers expert predictions, on-chain data breakdowns and breaking news all for free. Click the first link in the description, enter your email and join over 15,000 others to become a better crypto investor right now. Now here's Dylan Leclerc with his Bitcoin halving breakdown. And so I think when I say it's a demand event, I say you know, regardless of whatever Fed policy was doing last time in 2020, May of 2020, it was the money printer go burr. It was like the perfect narrative mm-hmm. of, oh my gosh, you know, quantitative tightening, supply having, algorithmic monetary policy, nobody can do anything to change it. Um, this time, I think it, you know, regardless of, of what the global macro situation looks like, I think it'll probably be a bit different, but that's still guesswork, you know, um, being this far ahead of time. It's, it's going to be bigger, I think, from like a cultural perspective and just an awareness perspective. Mm-hmm. Last time, like it did get a little bit of mainstream attention, but it's still just kind of like our little niche corner of the internet that was like, oh, the having, let's have a live stream. It wasn't like global news. And not necessarily that this one will be global yeah. news, but it'll be relatively a larger event. And yeah. whether the BOJ is printing or the ECB is, is you know, Christine Lagarde is opining on some you know, esoteric monetary policy or whatever Jerome Powell is saying, Bitcoin's having and nobody can change that. And so I think, you know, as when supply is as tightly constrained as it is this ha- this time around, as it was last time around, and, you know, I think more so, you know, th- three years or so after the bust phase mm-hmm. of the Bitcoin market is really like, that's kind of lined up very nicely with the halvings. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, maybe the halving was a driver, maybe not. Maybe it was global liquidity, maybe a bit of both. But that's when, you know, something like a, deba- a demand spark can really like ignite the market, right? Yeah. Like, like the supply was so primed. You had all this kindling you know, in May of 2020. And all it took was, you know, Sailor and Grayscale Bitcoin Trust to or just a couple hundred thousand Bitcoin 
and the market cap goes to a trillion, right? Yeah. So I think we're in a similar position, but it's it's a matter of if we get the the spark. Gotcha. The you know we what we can't factor in is there's still a massive information asymmetry, yeah. right? Really, like regardless of the having of just like you know fundamental Bitcoin mechanics. So yeah. like you talk to a really s- smart investor or you know you know Silicon Valley tech VC yeah. that you would expect to be you know relatively familiar with these basic concepts, and they go, oh well, what if? The 21 million has changed right like, I, right, like, right, it's, right. like it's a gotcha state yeah, yeah, yeah so i mean you know it's hmm. people people say like you know education 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 and from like an outsider's perspective they're like oh what are you pitching a ponzi yeah you know that's like the kind of the misinformed view of of what we mean by education and we're like no you just actually don't have an understanding of what this thing is so yeah. the having yeah the having can be a spark i think but what really is like priming these cycles post bus like why does bitcoin go randomly parabolic every three or four years well yeah the having you know has actually been very like cyclical in that regard and, and rhymed right with it with the run-up of these cycles but it's more so a bunch of really really orange filled bitcoiners that just hoard all the supply so tight mm-hmm. that all it takes is just a little bit mm. of demand and then you know whether it's you know, kind of a reflexive feedback loop, yeah. um, you know, growing adoption, network effect, Lindy, you know, Bitcoin just kind of just like the education component, more people adopting it. Yeah. All of a sudden, it's just this feedback loop and it reaches an exhaustion point when two things happen. Well, I guess you could almost say it's one thing, but it's price runs up so high that the people that have been hoarding the thing for the last two, three, four years, the people that are buying Bitcoin when it's down 80%, down 70%, yeah. down... 60% from the highs, you know, the people that aren't shaken out, like, yeah, well, maybe, like, I, I want a house. I want, you know, I want something nice. Like, money is, is just a means to an end, yeah. right? Like, I get the whole, like, Bitcoin is, you know, like, this kind of religious thing. Like, mm-hmm. I, I get it all. Yeah. I, I truly do. But money is just a means to an end, right? And so, like, if you're not going to spend it, that's your choice. But yeah. that's what money is for, right? It's just, just to receive, store, and you know, transfer value. Yeah. And so what do they do? The, the others take a little bit off the top and the, yeah. the supply transfers from strong hands to weak hands yeah. and buy, and, and, you know, the, the speculative mania of buyers just gets exhausted. And so price usually what collapses yeah. 30, 40, 50, 60, 70%. And all of a sudden we've bottomed at two, three, four, five X the previous, you know, mania high or right around it. Right. Like, Bitcoin's dead right now. It's yeah. 26,000. Right. This is five, six years ago. The absolute mania bubble unsustainable high was 20,000. Yeah. And so people will look at the linear chart and they'll always say either, well, Bitcoin's dead mm-hmm. or this is a massive bubble. Right. With no fundamental yeah. understanding of like, well, it's not this binary thing. And actually, if you yeah. understand this trend and you maybe you flip it to log scale, it's like, yeah. I feel like it shouldn't be that hard of a concept. Yeah. But that's what's playing out. And only like a, you know, a relatively small group of people actually can see that. With the current state of things, and then, you know, I'm not saying hyperinflation happens tomorrow, but like I would be bullish on Bitcoin, even if, if it existed in a state where global debt to GDP wasn't 400%, mm-hmm. and US debt to GDP wasn't 125%, mm-hmm. and then, you know, there wasn't a Ponzi scheme of, of entitlements and unfunded liabilities coming down the pipe in every developed nation on the planet. Mm-hmm. But those things all do exist. Mm. Um, like I would be I would be bullish on on Bitcoin regardless, just given its emergent properties and its and its, you know, dominant monetary properties compared to everything else. Yeah. It's absolutely scarce. It has a rising marginal production cost. It's it's you know, we know all the things I can <laughs> we can go to this. <laughs> but but the fiat state does matter actually and it's actually i think you know f- actually speeding up the adoption it's not it's not a coincidence in my opinion and i would maybe guess you say the same that satoshi released bitcoin you know in the midst or shortly after lehman and the financial crisis mm-hmm. right it seems like you know whether that was a coincidence or not uh you know there's some significance there no. like, hey i and he even writes about it he's like hey i have a solution to the ills of fiat currency mm-hmm. and you know that they create these credit bubbles that go bust. You can't trust mm-hmm. centralized intermediaries. And so, like, if we just think about the history of money, what is money? Yeah. Uh, and I have no idea. <laughs> and, we, and we just look, even in the past hundred years, I mean, there's, there's 
thousands of years of history. We can look at like you know even Chinese dynasties, but just in recent U.S. history, right? And this isn't just a U.S. centric view. This is global. But right, like what happens when these debt bubbles burst, right? Like on a similar question, is it a coincidence that world wars happen when debt levels get to the you know to the tipping point, 120 percent, 140 percent? World war currency reset, yeah. reestablish it, financial repression, right? Mm. Like, is that a coincidence? Is it a coincidence that, you know, after 11, 12 years of QE, zero rates, money printing around the planet, the yield curve inverts, the repo market blows up, mm -hmm. and COVID comes out of nowhere? Right. And like, am I a conspiracy theorist for that, for saying or suggesting such a thing? Oh, maybe not, but it, it, it lined up really well, mm -hmm. right? And they printed trillions of dollars. BlackRock comes out in 2019 and says, well, in the next, in the next recession, in the next downturn, there's going to need, need to be direct payments to the households and businesses to keep this, this thing going. Uh -huh. And then, they, you know, within a year, tens of trillions of dollars are printed. Yeah. So, you know, is that a cause and effect? Or is this just the, the natural order of, of how these systems you know, try to survive into their last, you know, diet in, in, in a dying state. Mm -hmm. um, if we think, okay, 2023, um, I kind of brief, uh, just like briefly mentioned 2019, you know, everybody like the, the leading indicators macro wise are saying, okay, we're going to have a recession. And, mm -hmm. you know, they're in the middle of a tightening cycle. Rates are already, you know, rates barely get to two and a half percent before the, the corporate bond market freezes up, mm -hmm. you know, the VIX spikes. And Paul McGettin, they start cutting rates before the, they don't, you know, this isn't a narrative. They cut rates before the pandemic, right? Mm. They, they topped in the, in the tightening cycle and started cutting. Mm. And if you just look at like fed tightening cycles, right? Just look at them. Like, never mind COVID. Cause everybody is like, oh, fed pivot up only, and, you know, we're, we're all going to make it money for to go burn. Mm. Um, if you just look at like the previous asset boom and bust cycles, and I, you know, I should remind you that like, if it's in the central bank minutes post-mortem that these central bankers are purposefully creating asset bubbles because of the Keynesian like wealth effect. Mm -hmm. He just listened to what Greenspan said and he was like, right. well, the, the tech bubble burst, we're, we're actually looking to directly stimulate housing. Mm -hmm. And they did. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so 2019, right? Starts, we start to see a slowdown. Bond markets freeze up a bit. Repo market blows up. The Fed starts inflating its balance sheet with repo market interventions, which is not QE in fall of 2019. The markets, the markets just float upwards. Volatility collapses. Fed balance sheet. Look at look look at the date. It's creeping up again before COVID, right? Mm -hmm. The the, the taper in the Fed balance sheet was going to be like watching paint dry. Mm -hmm. It wasn't mm -hmm. right. So all of a sudden, you know, January, February, March comes. COVID. They print a bunch of money. If we look at what the the IMF, these, you know, these bankers were saying in the middle of the 2010s, post GFC rates are still zero, money printer go burr, inflation can't manifest. That what they say is the only way to get out of these, this, this debt bubble, this sovereign debt bubble, mm -hmm. it's everything bubble in, in debt burdens is, is essentially re uh, financial repression. Mm -hmm. It's a sustained, they, they, they map it out. It's in the abstract of an academic yeah. IMF paper, right? It's, and they give historical examples and they basically say, and so it, the only way to get out of it is a wealth transfer from, from creditors. Yeah. And, and how do we do it? A sustained burst, usually an unexpected burst of high inflation, right? Mm. With yields capped artificially low, right? Mm. So 2020, if you look post, post COVID, post the announcement of buying uh, junk, you know, corporate bonds, post money printer go burr, I mean, they're still printing, but you see the ECB governors, you see the Fed governors, actively going out going on cnbc saying yeah we actually need inflation to run pretty hot mm -hmm. they changed their two percent inflation target to average inflation targeting right to mm -hmm. to, to kind right. of you know they're trying to let inflation go on cap right this is like classic central planning right yeah. micromanage a cpi index sure. well they got it right yeah. and i and in my opinion this is just my opinion it could could be wrong i think whether they weren't expecting a political pressure or it was just so intense that they couldn't manage it the goal like if they did it right and not right because it would have hurt a whole bunch of people mm -hmm. middle and lower class especially and it and it did mm -hmm. just like you referred to but if they could have had it their way 
they would have let inflation rip and keep ripping and kept yields low. Mm. So and and intentionally, because real debt to GDP or debt to G- GDP ratio went from like one thirty to I think like one sixteen. One like it, it got it it did go lower and it didn't go lower because they they stopped spending. It didn't go lower because they stopped issuing debt. It went lower because because nominal productivity inflation ripped. Nominal GDP ripped and debt burdens ripped, but less. Yeah. And so I think that that was the plan. And what they didn't expect everywhere in Western nations was the political, just like yeah. left and right, you know, just flaming Jerome Powell, Christine Lagarde, the political pressure was massive. Yeah. And so they always like, they had this plan and on, in paper, you know, in academia, it was the perfect plan. Mm. It's like, we're just going to devalue. They're not going to notice it. We're going to keep yields low, yeah. right? They were like zero rates till 2024, right? Mm-hmm. And imagine if inflation was eight, nine, 10% for four years. They could, I mean, they wouldn't have got out of it, but you know, who knows? It, it, it. Debt to GDP at 80%, which right. is more manageable, right? Yeah. Um, but it didn't work like that. And so we see the fastest tightening cycle in history, mm-hmm. zero to 5%, but inflation was still what? And that was a response to those political pressures. And yeah, in my in my opinion, yeah. and I think if you just kind of look at you know what they were saying about the yeah. independent Fed, right? Um, and you know there was like this kind of class warfare played into it to a certain extent, like the politicalization of it. Whereas with with you know the Trump era when inflation and CPI was one two percent, mm-hmm. Trump's like, look at our Fed. Why Europe has negative rates? Why don't we? Yeah, right? he's like stupid Jerome. Right. And and then it turned to Jerome, inflation is ten percent. And we have so many poor middle class people that are hurting mm-hmm. and both left and right were attacking it. So we see a tightening cycle, but throughout all of 2022, even though long duration debt, you know, bust the biggest, biggest drawdown in a hundred years, mm-hmm. inflation was still, and technically like the bond market people would get mad at me for using a trailing 12 month inflation reading mm-hmm. with current or forward yields, mm-hmm. but a Fed's fund rate at 5% when inflation is eight isn't tight monetary policy. Right. It's still a negative, you know, real yield. Yes. And so for the for the longest time in 2022, with I mean, we supposedly had tight policy, you know, inflation was still running higher than yields. And yeah. just recently, you know, we started to see the labor market cool a bit. Mm-hmm. CPI, PCE, however you want to measure it, fall, energy prices fall. I mean they drained the SPR to do it, but mm-hmm. but we've seen we've seen inflation come down while Rates are still five, five and five and change percent, five and a half percent. So now monetary policy, if we're just looking at it, you know, what maybe forward one year inflation, or you can do trailing one year inflation, um, forward one year inflation expectations, mm-hmm. obviously it's the tightest policy we've seen in 15, 20 years, mm-hmm. basically right before the massive bust in the great financial crisis mm-hmm. before the tech bubble. So tightest policy we've seen in decades. And now the narrative is like, well, you know, they've almost done it, right? The same Fed that was saying, okay, we want inflation to run hot, just, just you know, a little hot, not too hot, is now saying to get to fight inflation, we just want to create a little bit of weakness in the labor market. Not a lot of weakness, <laughs> but a little bit. A little bit of unemployment. A little bit of unemployment yeah. because we're going to combat inflation. So it's going to be a net benefit. Um, and I think this is, you know, in essence... Big picture, this is the central banking, central planning hubris, mm-hmm. right? Like Soviet style, you know, yeah. lever micro yeah. management of an emergent system that nobody can understand second, right. third, fourth order effects of. Um, but if we're looking at it in the context of like the macro of the next 12 months, you know, what do we see every time we start to see the labor market turn like this? What have we seen the past six, seven times at the yield curve? Mm-hmm. You know, inverts three month, ten year, three month, thirty year inverts right. as it does, right? It's it's not a coincidence that it precedes these economic recessions, yeah. these busts. So there's on chain analyst Dylan Leclerc on the upcoming Bitcoin halving in April 2024. A unique perspective, the idea that it's not just about the supply, but also the narrative that could potentially drive Bitcoin's price to new heights is something we'll all be watching closely. It's refreshing to hear such a contrarian viewpoint, especially from someone with Dylan's track record in on-chain analysis. 
Whether it's the cut in supply or the narrative increasing demand, it doesn't matter. They both result in the same thing, with the price of Bitcoin rising. Whether you're new to the crypto scene or a seasoned pro, it's essential to understand the underlying factors and narratives that drive market sentiment. Leclerc's insights into inflation, debt and money printing remind us of the broader economic landscape Bitcoin is situated in. If this conversation has sparked your interest and you're eager to keep up with the ever-evolving crypto world, don't forget to sign up to my daily 5-minute crypto newsletter. Tap into expert predictions, in-depth analysis, and stay informed on breaking news. Click the first link in the description to join the growing community. Anyway guys, hope today's video provided you with some value. I'll see you all in the next one, and as always, all the best.